Hello and welcome to West Virginia Press Insight, a production of the West Virginia newspaper industry. I'm Tom Hunter. And I'm Betsy DeBoard. Like you, we're interested in issues impacting West Virginia. We're looking at the top stories from newspapers across our state. Our goal is important news in an understandable format. West Virginia Press Insight focuses on policy and impact, not politics or personalities. Now let's look at stories from across West Virginia. Governor Jim Justice struck an optimistic tone in his State of the State address saying he looks forward to working with legislators over the next two months. The governor talked quite a bit about education in his speech, he even brought out his Greenbrier East High School girls basketball team to help him finish the 50 minute address with a cheer. Among his proposals are allowing students to earn an associate's degree while still in high school, a 13th year option for additional training, and free tuition for community colleges. The governor proposed a 1% pay raise for state employees and gradual elimination of the business inventory tax. He also called on natural gas companies and property owners to come together on a plan to allow drilling in places where not everyone agrees to develop the mineral. Justice also focused on tourism, proposing a $20 million budget increase to better market the state. Don Smith will have more on that topic when he sets down with State Tourism Commissioner Chelsea Ruby in our Insight segment. For more details on the 2018 State of the State Address, visit WVPress.org. You know, Tom, that's a very different tone from, from last year when the governor, as a Democrat, called for massive tax increases. I mean, that plan, of course, led to an extended special session, you know, to, to deal with the budget. Yeah, and Justice used the word miracle multiple times in his speech to describe what has occurred over the last year, saying it was a much dire situation a year ago to becoming a more promising one now. Right, and the road bond and potential billions of dollars in Chinese investments were other positive notes sounded by the governor last yeah. night. Yeah, and of course, the props came out again as well, the famous whiteboards and the infamous silver platter that we saw last session. Only this time when the player was uncovered, it contained a Hershey Kiss and an 8-track uh, titled Happy Days. So a much different tone from Governor Justice. The state's financial future appears brighter according to the 2019 budget proposed by the Justice Administration. The Gazette Mail's Phil Kabler reports that the $4.35 billion spending plan has $135 million in increased spending, including the first across-the-board pay raises for state employees in four years. Revenue officials say higher natural gas prices, stabilized coal markets, and job growth make the collection estimates higher than last year. Construction jobs in particular are on the rise, in part due to the $2.6 billion road bond passed last year. The upturn continues through the six years the state plans for, according to the Department of Revenue officials, a significant change from recent years. And Betsy, it's certainly going to be interesting to see how mm -hmm. lawmakers and the various interest groups respond to better budget news after years of belt tightening. Right. There's going to be a lot of pent-up demands and a lot of people eager to get a bigger piece of that growing budget pie. You're absolutely right. And the budget also shows that the state's fortunes remain closely tied to the energy industry, with much of the good news tied to the natural gas and coal prices in production. And of course, most, most state employees potentially could be seeing a 1% pay raise if that proposed budget passes, and corrections officers would potentially see a $2,000 a year increase over each of the next three years, an important step for those public safety positions. Absolutely. And of course, a lot of reaction from lawmakers inside the chamber on the governor's state of the state address as they listen to what the governor had to say to the joint meeting of the West Virginia Senate and the West Virginia House at the state capitol. In the Huntington Herald-Dispatch, Taylor Stuck reports on some of that lawmaker reaction from Cabell County. Delegate Matt Rohrball, a Republican, said he was frankly a little surprised that the governor wasn't more clear on specifics as it relates to job creation and taking advantage of the good economy. West Virginia employment is up. Our state GDP is among the fastest growing in the country. Yet Rohrball felt that justice was very short on specifics in his speech on how to capitalize on this economic momentum to move the state forward. Rohrball wants to know more specifics of the governor's plan in terms of how he plans to recruit new businesses to the state, but he did pledge to continue to work closely with Governor Justice to continue improving the state economy. Many legislators were also surprised that the governor was short on specifics as related to the correction officer pay raise package that's been discussed and proposed and the state jail system. Justice did, of course, mention he wanted that 1% pay raise for state employees within the speech, also touched on his desire to have a 5% raise for teachers across the state over the next 
five-year period. Now, Chad Lovejoy, a Democratic delegate from Cabell County, also had some feelings on the raises, saying he didn't feel like the raises went far enough. Lovejoy said he was very disappointed in not hearing anything from the governor about correctional officers and the pay issue there and that not being addressed within, gov within the governor's speech. Legislators did spend a lot of time over the summer looking at the correctional officer pay issue and visiting jails and prisons across the state. Lovejoy expected to hear many more specifics from the governor in terms of that topic. Of course, you can read more about more reaction from lawmakers to the governor's state of the state address at herald-dispatch.com. And to read a full text of the governor's state of the state address, you can find that online at the governor's website at governor.wv.gov. The West Virginia newspaper industry lost a legend with the passing of former Charleston Gazette reporter Paul Nyden. Nyden died on January 6th, and a legion of friends, sources, and elected officials remembered Paul as a crusading reporter who fought for social justice. He also nurtured dozens of young reporters both in the Gazette newsroom and at his popular Sunday evening dinners at his home. As his Gazette colleague Ken Ward Jr. noted in the story remembering Paul Nyden, the investigative reporter was seemingly fearless in print, but almost unwaveringly kind in person. Paul was a true expert in the state's coal industry, writing about the industry for decades. He uncovered widespread abuses in the state's workers' compensation system, helping to lead the changes that have made that system much more stable financially. His interests covered a wide range of subjects, including politics, literature, and sports, and he was a particularly big fan of Charleston's minor league baseball teams going back decades. Throughout his four decades of distinguished reporting covering issues affecting our state, Paul covered some of the state's biggest political figures, such as U.S. Senator Robert C. Byrd, developing close relationships with them beyond deadlines and bylines. Our thoughts go out to his family, including his wife Sarah, daughters Carrie and Catherine, and son Christopher. Paul Nyden was 72. West Virginia University's School of Dentistry fourth year dentistry students travel throughout West Virginia to bring healthy lifestyle choices to rural areas. Over the course of a year, dental students have performed more than 17,000 clinical procedures. It's a great partnership. Students receive valuable experience, rural dentists get an extra set of helping hands, and state residents get the care they need in an affordable way. In our WVU Today segment, we take a closer look at the program. My name is Grace Garcia. So I'm originally from Colombia. So I went to Romney, which is in Hampshire County, West Virginia. It's a fascinating experience, in my opinion. When you go to a rural site, you actually get to see what so many people out there really are in need of a dentist. It's, it's a very rewarding experience. I felt like I was able to work a lot faster. That's one thing I feel like a lot more independent and more confident of doing my own treatment plan and actually doing the procedures also. And Betsy, this is a great example of how our state's higher education institutions have a tremendous impact on people across the state of West Virginia, not just in the towns in which they're located. You're right, and dental care is an area where we need a lot of help. Unfortunately, West Virginia often ranks near the bottom when it comes to oral health care. And this is an area where improvement can have uh, multiple impacts. Not only does it help to avoid the costly and painful health, health issues, but better tooth care can be an issue of self-esteem, making people less conscious, self-conscious about how they look. Yes, this has been really great work by WVU. Outstanding. A group of 10 higher education institutions want to help nearly two dozen southern West Virginia counties improve their economies and quality of life. Jordan Nelson reports in the Beckley Register Herald about the Alliance for Economic Development of Southern West Virginia. The group wants to leverage educational resources and workforce training programs to help create jobs and revitalize communities. Marshall University President Jerome Gilbert said during the announcement that the Alliance wants to keep families here at home and rebuild communities. West Virginia State University President Anthony Jenkins added, that's a crucial time for our state and the group can help solve problems facing Southern West Virginia. We all know how hard Southern West Virginia has been hit by the coal decline, and people agree it's not coming back at the levels that it was in the past. Yeah, and it's good, Betsy, to see higher education from community and technical mm -hmm. college level all the way up to four-year institutions and the School of Osteopathic Medicine working together on these common problems in communities. You're right, it is. And workforce training is, is a critical part of bringing businesses and jobs to the state. And it sounds like this alliance can really help with that. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see how this group evolves and what impact it can have, mm -hmm. particularly when it comes to keeping our young people and families here at home in West Virginia. Each January, news media from across the Mountain State gather in Charleston for the legislative look ahead. 
More than 30 reporters and editors gathered at the offices of the Charleston Gazette Mail to hear Senate President Mitch Carmichael, House Speaker Tim Armstead, and other legislators and leaders preview the 2018 legislative session. In the intelligencer of Wheeling, Jocelyn King reports that West Virginia state leaders believe there is money in the state budget to move West Virginia forward. Legislative leaders say the state's economy is growing and more budget cuts will not be necessary. Raul Balsop, the Vice President of Strategic Initiatives at West Virginia University, joined Senate President Carmichael and House Speaker Armstead at the Legislative Look Ahead to talk about the West Virginia Forward Report, which outlines a plan to improve the state. Among other items, the report calls for an investment in rebranding West Virginia, site preparation and business development, and tackling the opioid crisis. You know, Tom, legislators said the West Virginia Forward Report is being considered as bills are being prepared this year. Yeah, and WVU's Rob Alsop did say that funding for promotion of West Virginia and implementing the plan is crucial for its success. It is, and one area of, of surprise in this report is that West Virginia business taxes are among the top 20 in the nation. For more information on this story, visit theintelligencer.net. In the Charleston Gazette Mail, Ryan Quinn reports teacher seniority might not be the deciding issue when considering staffing cuts at public schools in the future. Delegate Joe Statler, vice chairman of the House Education Committee, expects a bill to change that policy and give local school boards more authority as to whom to keep. Delegate Robert Thompson, a Wayne County educator, opposes dropping seniority, fearing it will lead to political influence in hiring and nepotism. Christine Campbell, Western New State President of the American Federation of Teachers, is concerned that more teachers will soon leave the state. Campbell said more money is needed for teacher salaries, with the greatest challenges in border counties where teachers are more likely to move across state lines to work and make a living wage. And Betsy, you know, there's nearly 700 vacant teaching positions all across the state of West Virginia. Yes, there are. Vacancies in teaching and correctional officer positions are expected to be two primary issues of focus this session. Of course, you can read more about this issue online at wvgazettemail.com. Coming up, West Virginia Press Association Executive Director Don Smith goes in-depth with West Virginia State Tourism Commissioner Chelsea Ruby. Welcome to In-Depth. I'm Don Smith, and today we're looking at tourism in West Virginia. Our guest is Chelsea Ruby, Tourism Commissioner for the West Virginia Office of Tourism. Chelsea, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. Glad to have you. Big news last night at the State of the State. Tourism it's in line for a $20 million budget increase? Yep. Uh, great, great. Let's talk about that. Now, that money, is that for the overall budget or just marketing and promotion? How's that, how's that used? It's going to be for marketing and advertising. Um, we were originally going to ask for $15 million. I met with the governor. He honestly said, Chelsea, you're thinking too small. We've got to be more competitive. We need to put more into it. Um, so we've increased it to about $20 million now, and that'll be just tied to marketing and promotions. We have a separate operating budget. Okay. Now, I want to make sure that I, I, I'm clear. $20 million is 20 million more than you had last year or the total is 20 million? The now? total will be about 20 million. Our total is, is kind of hard to pinpoint. Um, last year we had about six. We're adding in an additional 14 million, but honestly our overall budget will be even bigger than that. We have a program um, called our Cooperative Advertising Program that allows our private tourism partners to actually buy into our advertising. So we're hoping to put more money in that program next year, which may bring in some additional private dollars to the tone, tune of three or four million. So you're looking a little, in addition to the state spending, you're hoping for some public-private spending. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Great. Well, tourism has a lot of support at the Capitol. Even the Democrats, that's the one area they talked about in their caucus, that they were very uh, much in line with the governor in talking about tourism spending. And Bill Hartman, delegate for Randolph County, said that He's, un he, he's seen studies that say an investment in tourism brings back about a $7 to $1 return on investment. So I've got good news. We just got new numbers yesterday and last year's campaign actually bumped it up a little bit. So we're looking at a set, an 8 to 1 now instead of 7 to 1. So every dollar that's spent on tourism advertising brings in $8 in state and local taxes. Okay, now Chelsea, that 8, is that a national study or is that for West Virginia? It's for West Virginia, yeah, and wow. it's in line. Um, states see generally bete between 6 and 12. Um, we're sitting at eight, so we're doing pretty well. If you think about it, you know, when people come into the state, they're going to be paying the hotel motel tax, gas taxes. Um, so it, it really, it's a, it's a really great investment for the state. Great, great. Well, that's the future. We've got up to 20 million to spend, more than 20 mm -hmm. million to spend now. But let's talk a little bit about what West Virginia tourism is right now. Okay. 
where are we in terms of marketing the state and tourism in West Virginia? So right now, tourism is a big industry in West Virginia. Now, each year we bring in just a little over $4 billion. Last year we were at $4.1 in traveler spending, meaning that folks from outside of the state or people in state traveling 50 miles or more contributed $4 billion to the state's economy. That um, keeps about 45,000 jobs in the state and contributes $527 million in taxes. So if we were to get rid of tourism, we stopped having tourism in the state, every household would have to pay an additional $700 a year in taxes to make up for that lost revenue. So it's, wow. it's really important to the state's economy. Now, every part of the state's different, and some regions have more than mm -hmm. others, we'll talk about it, but tourism dollars impact almost every county, correct? Absolutely, and you know, the thing about tourism is, you know, people think about the big resorts, you know, the ski resorts, or the Hatfield-McCoy trails, or, you know, the Greenbrier, bigger things, but really the impact of tourism is felt throughout the communities. I was up at Winter Place last week and stopped at a local restaurant on the way home, and you know, everyone in there had, was there to ski, and you could tell, because they were all wearing their lift ticket tags. So you know, you know, the impact goes far beyond the resorts themselves. It brings in folks to put money into our restaurants, local shops, I mean, the really, it's a far-reaching impact. And because it's, it would seem that because it's not just dependent on outside people or local residents that it may weather the economic dips a little better than some of the other industries. Yeah, it does. I mean, of course, you know, when the economy is down, people have less money and are spending more. You know, we do see some dips, um, but we've been relatively stable. Um, you know, what I'll tell you is that when you compare tourism in West Virginia to our surrounding states, what you find is that West Virginia is really low. We're not reaching our potential. You know, I just told you we're at 4.1 billion. Every state around us is at least double, but some of them are five to six times more. Kentucky is wow. the next lowest. They're at nine billion a year. Um, Ohio is in the 40s. So they're they're really outpacing us. Um, and I try not to focus on those because it's you know we've got enough statistics to say we're doing right. poorly in something. But really, if you look at those numbers, what you find is that we're in a very heavily trafficked region meaning that there are tons of people coming to this region on vacation, and we just have to do a better job of getting our message out and getting some of those folks to come to West Virginia. Okay. Do we have, it's been a rough five years in West Virginia. We've had some rough times. Have we lost many tourism facilities, small or large? Uh, are we about the same as we, are, are people hanging on? Yeah, I mean, we've seen our traveler spending go down, definitely okay. in the last four years. We've seen a dip. Um, but as far as businesses closing, you know, I can't really say that we've had a huge impact on losing resorts or any of our major players. But, you know, they've definitely been feeling the impacts. I think it's one of the reasons the industry is so strongly behind this increased funding proposal. You know, every state in the country, every single year, because they rely on state appropriations, they study the effectiveness of tourism advertising. And like I told you, everybody finds that, that, the, that there's this positive return. Great, great. Now, it seems like marketing may be the answer to this question, but there are probably other things too. What are the biggest needs for West Virginia tourism right now? What, if you had a, a wish list and, and an unlimited budget, what are your needs? What would you do for West Virginia? I absolutely have a list, a wish list, <laughs> um, that I will take to my budget hearings to show how we intend to spend that money. Um, I would tell you that the number one thing we need to do is we have to increase exposure. You know, it's no secret that we've got a lot of misconceptions about the state of West Virginia out there. We've got image problems. We've got to overcome those. You know, in recent years, our advertising budget has been small, and we haven't been able to work on overcoming those. So we're really just not top of mind for anyone coming to this region, trying to think of where to go on vacation. But we're also at a disadvantage because if you look at the overall marketing money coming out of the state of West Virginia, it's so much lower than our surrounding states. It's not just that our state marketing budget is smaller, but our CVBs budgets are smaller. You know, most of our surrounding states have two or three CVBs that have budgets larger than the states. We don't have anybody that's even half of ours. So overall, the impact of come to West Virginia is just not as strong as it is from other states. Okay. So we've got to bring everybody together and get that message out. So we have some we have some needs. What are our advantages? Advantages are many. We are without question the best kept secret on the East Coast. I mean, we are a premier tourism destination, but like I said, we just haven't been able to get our message out in the past. Premier in terms of places, resorts, just general activities, expense. 
uh, when yeah. you bring your family in? A lot of different things. First, I would tell you we're a four season destination. Okay. A lot of states don't have that. They have one or two seasons where they advertise. It's unusual to find a state that advertises all four seasons like okay. we do. So four season, I would tell you, is number one. Um, but then if you look, you know, we've got a lot of diverse products in the state. You know, if you look at the Potomac Highlands, the Eastern Panhandle, then you look at Southern West Virginia, they're all just very different. But the one thing that's in common with any place you visit in the state of West Virginia is that it is breathtakingly beautiful. True. I don't want to dwell on a negative, but what are a dis if you if you said, boy, this is a disadvantage for us, what do we have in terms of a disadvantage that's built into West Virginia? You know, a disadvantage we have, honestly, is the roads. Um, I was one of the biggest supporters of the road bond just because I knew what it meant for tourism. Um, when you look at tourism in West Virginia, on average, people stay about two nights. The national average is 4.5. So we've got to get people to stay longer. And in order to do that, in some cases, we've got to get them to travel from point A to point B to visit multiple different places. Um, and without roads in good condition, you know, we're going to run off some of those visitors. So we're, I'm really excited to see some of this construction get started. Right. Great. Uh, visitors coming in are one area of tourism, but also West Virginians, people travel across the state or they go to the local resort, the ski resort, or they just get away for the weekend. Uh, do you find that most West, are West Virginians taking advantage of our own resources in terms of tourism? Do we get a lot of that? So first, let me tell you, you're right. Our biggest market is West Virginia. It's folks who are traveling in the state to go visit another place. Um, but no, I don't think we take advantage of that. I mean, I can say myself, you know, as the state tourism commissioner, before I took this job, there were a lot of places I hadn't been, a lot of things I hadn't done. So no, I think that, you know, getting out and exploring your own state is, is a big part of this. And you'll see um, next year in our advertising plan, you know, a large portion of our budget does go to in-state marketing to get folks in-state to realize what's in their own backyard. Okay. Now, your office and I've worked, heard some of the presentations, you want to raise all boats. It's West Virginia first. But tourism areas and tourism resorts and facilities, there's only so many tourists coming to the state in a year, and there's only so much money spent. So they're actually competing against each other. So, you know, they think that that money would be better spent and the tourists would have a better time at my location than one in another part of the state. How does that competition impact your, your office and your rate of success? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, I always tell people you're not competing with the other resorts in the state. You're competing with Myrtle Beach. You're competing with Michigan. You're competing with other big destinations. You know, like I said, going back to my example, when people come here, they're just not staying as long as they are in other states. So one of our big initiatives has been to get our regions to come together. You know, a lot of times I get asked by legislators or, you know, industry folks, how does our budget compare to other states. And then they'll follow up and ask me, how does that compare to the other state's overall state budget? And I always try to remind people that that doesn't matter. We're all competing for the same consumers. And nobody who sees an ad says, well, you know, I haven't seen as many ads for West Virginia, but they're a smaller state with a smaller budget and probably can't afford it. So really, we're all competing. There's no handicap in the market for being okay. a smaller state. So I think that's an important point to make. But to your other question on prioritizing regions, you know, all of our regions are really diverse. We've got nine travel regions in the state. They all have different products. Um, some of them are stronger in one season than the other. Um, but really, we don't have a hard time with that. It's great that we have so many things, so many different things to promote. Um, you know, some levels, some regions of the state have more money to put into mm -hmm. our programs than others, so they naturally, you know, get more promotion, but really that hasn't been a huge problem. Okay. It'd be good to have that problem, Right. Huh? Yeah. That, I'm looking forward to having that problem. Well, one of the things that i thinking about getting people in, when I lived in Tucker County uh, for several years, lo the local residents there sort of adopt you, and guys such as, and I'll just, Hap and Kevin, Billy, Ron, Jim, and there's always a Bubba, yep. would take you <laughs> and take, take you to the best fishing spots, uh, the best places to dig ramps, where right. to go hunting, and they just sort of adopt you when you move in and, and you find these. Now, I've moved and I don't get back there like I used to to Tucker County, but I want to. I have to think that people who, the former residents who lived here and moved away, mm -hmm. uh, be it kids or just completely moved, or visitors who have been here once and met somebody and moved away, uh, 
they're easier to get back. Do you try to reach those people? Is there campaigns that you do to try to reach people who have stayed here before or who have lived here before? Yeah, that's certainly something we're looking into. I think we're even going to work with the universities um, to work on alumni outreach, to reach out to folks and try to bring some of those folks back. We've done a little bit of that. Um, but you're absolutely right that people come back. My favorite tourism statistic is that 86% of people who come to the state come back. So we know that if we get them here, they fall in love with the state and they keep coming back. We've just got to get more money to get that exposure to get them here that first time. Okay, great. In closing, Chelsea, how will you measure, how should the legislature, how should the people of West Virginia measure success in tourism moving forward? Now you've got more money. Uh, it, again, like you say, you're aver you don't get to buy advertising at a cheaper right. rate because we're a smaller state, so it won't go as far, but you've got more to work with. Mm -hmm. How do we measure success in our tourism industry moving forward? So we've got a lot of different metrics we look at. We look at people who visit our website, people who call our 800 number, people who order travel guides. But at the end of the day, we measure success by how many people come here and how much money they contribute to West Virginia's economy and the jobs that those support. So at the end of the day, you know, we're held accountable and if we get this $20 million, we'll be coming back the next year and saying to the legislature, these are the results. This is the money that came into West Virginia's economy because of this investment. So it's a concrete number. You're not you're not asking for, well, we did a good job, it looked nice. You're no, saying this not. is this is what we did with the money we had. Absolutely. There's tax revenues. I mean, there, there are easy ways to track it and to find out. Well, we can't ask for much more than that with our tax dollars. So I want to thank you for your time, Chelsea. Good to have you here. Thanks for having me. Next, we'll have Betsy DeBoer with a look at the, some of the video and some of the images that the Office of Tourism uses to promote West Virginia. The West Virginia Tourism Office uses some amazing footage to promote West Virginia, showing great spots in the state. And with the hashtag Almost Heaven, all West Virginians are encouraged to show their favorite spots in the Mountain State. So everyone, now is the time to show your favorite spots in West Virginia. Share your photos with us on social media at the West Virginia Press Association Facebook and Twitter pages. And remember to use the hashtag Almost Heaven.